Rag Radio. This is KOOP, Hornsby, Austin. Uh, I'm Thorne Dreyer, and this is RAG Radio. Tracy Schultz is my engineer. Tracy, how are you today? Uh, doing well, thank you. Okay, and uh, Jeff Zavala of zgraphics.org is filming the show today. He's filmed a bunch of our shows lately, and hopefully we'll film all of them in the future. And uh, if you want to see any of the shows that are, that are up there, the, any of the videos of our shows, you can go to zgraphics.org. Blip.tv. Quote, the position of the Americans is therefore quite exceptional, and it may be believed that no democratic people will ever be placed in a similar one. Alexei de Tocqueville, Democracy in America, 1835. The following from Jim Turpin, uh, 2012, <laughs> Jim, <laughs> in the RAG blog in an article called The Myth of American Exceptionalism, Jim wrote, America is indeed exceptional on many levels. We remain a country envied around the globe for our ability to create, think, and believe we can be a better place for all people. Maybe we only now are beginning to see that war, nationalism, wealth, and power are not the tools to make this happen. Peace activist and writer Jim Turpin is a native Austinite with a Bachelor of Science in Speech Communications from the University of Texas at Austin. He uh, is a member of Code Pink Austin and an associate member of Veterans for Peace. He also volunteers at Under the Hood Cafe and Outreach Center, uh, the GI Coffee House at Florida, Texas, and is a contributor to the RAG blog, and he works in uh, public health in Austin. So. In his RAG blog article on American exceptionalism, and you can find that going to the ragblog.blogspot.com and just uh, scroll down or search Jim Turpin, T-U-R-P-I-N. He points out that the United States is number one in the world in military spending with troop presence in over 150 countries, has record levels of hunger, poverty, and unemployment, has seen the rise of an Orwellian national security state, and has experienced obscene accumulation of wealth by a corporate plutocracy with record corporate profits while middle-class American families have lost a staggering 39% of their net wealth. Jim Turpin, welcome to RAG Radio. Thanks, Lauren. Appreciate it today. It's great to have you here. Thanks. Uh, how did you have, I think it's interesting how you decided to work, to do this article, to do the research on this. Well, you know, I think, you know, we talked earlier today that Every election year, every election cycle, you, you know, politicians on both sides of, of both political parties tend to trot out this theory of American exceptionalism. They trot out America each other, which I, you know, it, nothing bothers me more when that happens. And, you know, this has happened for, for decades. And, you know, I, I'd started writing this article. Uh, I, to be honest, I can't remember which party it was. They, they started off with this, this whole shining city on the hill uh, theme. And, and to me... You know, as I talk about in the article, um, you know, the Shining City on the Hill references from John Winthrop. And yeah, Ronald Reagan made it more recently. That's <laughs> true. In his farewell speech in 1989, he, he extols the Shining City on the Hill. And, you know, what, what Reagan doesn't realize or what he doesn't really tell you is that, you know, Winthrop's model of Christian ther uh, charity it talks about very specifically that, you know, here are the, here are the Puritans going to the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, it's a new adventure. You know, he, he's really trying to extol his Christian brethren to be charitable. You know, if they're hungry, give them food. If they're, you know, if they're cold, give them wood. You know, you know those kind of things. But you know, Reagan, as you remember, wasn't known for his charitable outcomes in his in his policies and administration. Yeah. You know, from ketchup being a vegetable, the the national <laughs> school lunch program, to the savings and loan scandal, to you know the AIDS crisis, which was a disaster. You know, charity wasn't on his mind, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and of course, I still think ketchup is a vegetable, but I think that's a wonderful <laughs> story. Uh, we're going to talk about your article because I right. think it's very interesting the way you break things down. Uh, and then we're also going to talk about, you've been involved, especially you've worked a lot with, with GIs who right. come back. You've worked with the Under, with the, under the Hood uh, Coffee House right. uh, in, uh, in Colleen. Right. Uh, and you've worked with Code Pink, and Code Pink is, as an activist, Code Pink is, a, I think, is a fascinating. Maybe, the, you know, 
one of the more interesting and, and more effective groups out there working today. Uh, we'll talk about all of that. We'll talk especially about, you know, you've written before for the RAG blog, and all of, all of the stuff Jim writes is it's fascinating, well-documented with lots of, lots of information, lots of statistics, and, um, and a really interesting overview. So we'll talk about all of that stuff. Um, first, this whole issue of American exceptionalism. One of, my, one of the things that I've got is why do we feel that we have to be the best? You know, why is that's, it's almost like, it's not just whether we are or not, why, you know, just by thinking that's the issue, then we create this whole dynamic, you know? Well, I, I think it's, you know, we talked about the election year, but it's kind of that old political saw of, you know, we're the best, we're the greatest, go red, white, and blue. And, and there's nothing wrong with, um, being exceptional, but no, no, no. you know we're, we're not. You know, you know I don't talk about other statistics in this article, but you know we, you talked about my background in public health. But you know we're 49th in infant mortality rates. You know countries like Slovenia are ahead of the United States on, on those kind of things. But you know if you say something, it should it should be true. You know, and you, you know the issue that I have is you know they they politicians typically again they bring out this whole issue but is it true no it's not but you know i think our country is founded on the principles this this puritan americana that you know we are the best we came over you know we 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 did these amazing things to form this country but you know the reality behind the bravado just just doesn't hold water. Well, it's it's interesting because in, you know certainly the Declaration of Independence, certainly the founding, it has there's a lot of ideals there that, that are just that were remarkable and that have set you know a pattern Absolutely. for a lot of stuff. Of course, we also have to remember that we stole the country, uh, right. and that uh, the the Declaration of Independence, you know, that I, the all of the rights were basically for you know white slave male, holding slave holding uh, males, right? Slave holding males and right. and uh, that. So there's there's a lot at the really at the core of it. Well, sure. But on the other hand, those original principles probably helped to make us probably set a pattern for which we've overcome a lot of the other stuff. You know, for which we've we've because you know, it was the times, and part of it you always have to sure the times. But uh, you know, the things that you talk about in this article, and you break it down into several categories, but you say that. In 2010, the U.S. spent $698 billion on its military, as much as the top 15 other countries combined. Uh, that uh, 43% of the total world's share of military spending. Uh, though the U.S. accounts for about 5% of the world's population, we now account for almost 50% of the military spending. Uh, so that's, I guess, the first area in which you talk about our exceptionalism. Well, yeah, and there's some, there's some great statistics that, that are talked about in this article. But the other thing, if you think about it, it's, it's mind-boggling. We have presence, true presence, uh, you know, a, 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 a boot imprint in 150 countries around the world. You know, we, we're still in countries like Japan, Germany, South Korea. I mean, if, if I recall, those conflicts were over 65 years ago. So, you know, why are we spending these massive amounts of money on these particular uh, imperial dynamics around the world? And the, the issue for me is, you know, there's these, these enormous costs that, that, that we've, we've wasted, but, you know, why do we continue to do this? Why, and, you know, the answer, I think, honestly, is, either, you know, we, we typically have policy made by a, a very few members in this country, a few uh, individuals in this country. And, you know, a, a great example is, you know, I was thinking recently about, you know, Department of Homeland Security. You know, you know Michael Chertoff was the head of Department of Homeland Security, he recently left in 2009. When he left, he started the Chertoff Consulting Group, and they're a security consulting company. They immediately installed what are called RapaScan, those body scanners, in, in airports. So the answer to why we spend money in this country, whether it's on security or war, is really it's about profit. It's, it's about companies like Boeing, Halliburton, Raytheon, all the ones that you and I know about that, that basically funnel these dollars to the stockholder. And to, to, and to the 1%. And, and, you know, of course, every, Eisenhower warned us about the military-industrial right. complex, and now it's much more than just military-industrial. It's military-industrial security. Uh, right. the, it, it, it's just massive. And so it's, it, it's not something that even is easily uh, 
and then we've evolved something called an endless war. Right. Uh, and so that, that, that feeds that and is fed by that. How do we break out of that? Well, it, it's hard. You know, we, we've given this administration and the ones prior an open-ended um, checkbook. And the, the authorization of use of military force, which was passed the, the same month of 9-11, gives the president open-ended access to basically do as he pleases. And I'll talk a little bit later in the article about, you know, we're, we're now assassinating American citizens abroad, you know, without due process. And, you know, now that the global war on terror is, as Orwell calls it, the endless war, you know, we, uh, there's no end to this. I mean, we, we, we're unfortunately in a situation now where we have an open-ended war, we have an open-ended checkbook. And now we're, we're burning out our soldiers, which we'll talk right. about a little bit later. Right. Oh, we yeah. definitely, definitely will. Issues right. of PTSD and, and military suicides right. and, uh, and whatever, which are at record. Absolutely. Um, okay, the second area that you talk about, I guess, is, is poverty, hunger, and unemployment, uh, which you point out that we're – interestingly enough, you also point out that uh, – that according to the U.S. Census Bureau, nine states exhibited statistically significant higher household food insecurity rates than the U.S. national average. And uh, number one was Mississippi, and number two was Texas. Uh, if we didn't spend all of that money on the right. military and on our adventures around the world, couldn't we do be doing a lot? <laughs> well, I mean, it's sad. I mean, you know, we're one of the top industrialized nations in the world, and in our poverty rates are appalling. You know, we, the Census Bureau recently last year put a, a figure out that said that, you know, there, there are 46.2 million people in poverty in this country, which is huge. You know, and, and, uh, and 16 million of those are children. You know, 20.5 uh, million Americans live in extreme poverty. What that's defined at is that their cash, the family's cash volume income is less than half the poverty line. In other words, a family of four living on $10,000. So 20 million people live on that. I mean, that's, that's uh, astounding to me as an American. It's, it, it's, it's remarkable when, you know, when we hear the statistics uh, about where we stand in the world in so many areas that involve quality of life, right. you know, health, insurance, uh, uh, you know, medical care, life expectancy. Right. We're just way, way down there. Well, and, and the other thing, there's a new term out that some people may be familiar with, and from my public health back, background, I'm a little more familiar with. It's called food desert, and that sounds like an oxymoron, but what it really means is it's a USDA um, measurement that if you live in a specific area where your, your income level is a certain percent, where at least you know twenty percent of the inhabitants are below the poverty line, and they live uh, within a specific uh, radius of, of access to food. In other words, if you're poor and you don't have access to food, you live in a food desert. And what's remarkable is, you know, a huge number of Americans live in food deserts. An example is go to East Austin. How many grocery stores? How many HEBs? How many, you know? Specific chain grocery stores you see in East Austin, there's aren't any there. So really, Austin, parts of Austin are considered a food desert. So if you're poor and you don't have access... And Austin is comparatively doing very well. So. Right, right, right. So if you're poor and you're making below the poverty level and you don't have access to food, you know, what do you do? Well, you go get the dollar value menu for a dollar and, you, you know, you fill stomachs. And you know, this leads to the whole issue of obesity and other issues that are endemic. Diabetes. Endemic and with then the Then we talk about money and public health and emergency rooms right. and health insurance, right. and it all is interconnected. It, exactly right. Of course, you're involved in public health, and all the whole, all of the, the issues about health, and health insurance right now are, are at the fore uh, with the recent right. Supreme Court decision. And now with uh, Rick Perry, uh, as long as we're in this area, and Rick Perry <laughs> saying that he's not going to take the federal funds uh, right. for uh, expanding Medicaid. And, right. And is not going to set up exchanges and right. whatever. I mean, is that shooting yourself in the foot? Well, for this ideology, is, for this some is, kind of abstract principle. Yeah, this is political hubris on Perry's part by not accepting thirteen billion dollars in Medicaid. What you're doing is you're forcing those people to use the uh, ER and to basically suck up public funds. So you're squeezing the balloon. If you don't pay for it one place, you're going to pay for it for another. And this is grandstanding at its height by Perry. 
And, you know, this is a huge mistake for the people of Texas. And you're really punishing the people that need the care. You know, people that are, you know, live below the poverty line. And each state establishes a Medicaid level that, uh, and Texas has one of the worst, one of the lowest Medicaid um, threshold levels in the country. So these are the poorest of the poor that he's punishing. And of course, when you punish the poor, you punish those folks that don't have any political power. I mean, you know, who among those that have, they're taking Medicaid are, are organized, you know. So Perry knows what he's doing. He's, he's playing to the party. He's playing to the politics of the Republican Party. And it's, it's sad. People are, are truly going to suffer as a result of this. Yeah. We'll be right back. I'm Thorn Dreyer. This is Rag Radio. We did a show with David Lindsay. Uh, David Lindsay is a, a, a mystery and suspense writer uh, who is doing a series right now on it, it, which on the security contracting establishment, as it were. I mean, the whole new uh, uh, intelligence uh, information uh, uh, industry. And uh, it was fascinating. He's done a whole bunch of research on it. And I believe, was it the Washington Post? Right. That did some amazing work in that area. So one of the sections of your, and it's just, it's just astounding and it's scary and we don't even know how much money is going into it because it's hidden in so many ways, it's invisible. Um, one of the sections of your, you know, of your article about uh, exceptionalism, US, American exceptionalism, is about the rise of the US national security state. You say that the United States uh, since 19, not since 9-11 has created a massive bureaucratic and basically unaccountable national security apparatus that not only is costing billions of dollars but has unfettered access to information about the American public. Tell us about that. You mentioned the Washington Post, and, and they fairly recently did a, a, a series called Top Secret America in it, um, th that was out, and it talks about this particular topic. And, you, you know, the, their report findings are, like you mentioned, staggering. They, you know, there are approximately 6,000 companies, private companies, that work on national security issues and you know prior to 9-11 this this intelligence gathering network this bureaucracy really didn't exist and you know th these companies related to counterterrorism, terrorism homeland security and intelligence are in about 10,000 locations around the country I mean that's that's significant um, you know an estimated almost 900,000 people you know nearly one and a half times as many people that live in DC work on counterterrorism and work on on this particular bureaucratic apparatus. Um, you know, many of these agencies do the same work. There's a lot of redundancy. So your tax dollar, obviously, they don't talk to each other. Your tax dollar has been wasted. And to be really honest, you know, do we want this to be happening? I mean, um, you know, early on, post Watergate, if you recall, the, the FISA courts approved uh, these type of investigations. So before you could go and, let's say, look at Jim Turpin's uh, letter writing or, or back then in the 70s, you had to get a FISA court approval. And it was pretty much a rubber stamp. But now, as we all remember, George W. Bush did not get FISA court approval and started looking at phone records and internet records and those kind of things. And you know, this is now, this whole type of behavior has just been put on steroids by the present administration. I mean, this is a, it's a money maker for corporations. It's a uh, you know, it, it's questionable constitutionally, and it, it's going on right now, and it, and it continues unabated. Well, we, we, those of us who were around in the good old days, back in the day, we know that the, what the FBI did with uh, its COINTEL program, right. uh, and it, not only the FBI, virtually every major agency in this country, and the spying that they did and the extra legal activities that went on, and yet now things are going on that are are much worse than 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 the things that went on during uh, those days, and all of it was justified by the terror, by the attacks, the nine eleven attacks. And, and tell me how I mean, it seems like we just our society has changed, our culture has changed as a result of the the way that politicians use nine eleven, uh, the way that that uh, so many laws have been. Uh, 
it's been used as an excuse for so many laws and so many changes. What right? Well, is well, that part where this all started? Well, and, and I think absolutely. And and the thing that drives this whole behavior, I think, is is fear. Post nine eleven, you know, the the country. A fertile ground for politicians, fear. Well, absolutely. <laughs> and, and really, it, there's some neuroscience behind this, and I won't get into the specifics. And one of the other articles I wrote for the RAG blog, they can read that if they'd like. But it, it, typically, there's a little part of your brain called the amygdala, and it's the fear center. And if you can stimulate that thing, it, it also is the part of your brain that doesn't allow you to really put together concepts. So if you stimulate that fear center in the brain, then suddenly, you know, you're you're open to interpretation of what you're going to do. So fear stimulates, you, you know, you tell a big enough lie, you scare people, people are going to, going to run and follow you, um, you know, kind of willy-nilly. And, and post 9-11, people wanted to be safe. The soccer moms wanted to be safe. You know, they wanted, you know, everybody remembers when we didn't fly for about two weeks post 9-11. So, you know, the, the country had to get back, back on track. So what do you do? Well, you set up the Department of Homeland Security, you do the TSA, you do, you know, you put in these body scanners I mentioned earlier. And, you know, fear's profitable. Fear helps run, you know, run a lot of these corporations and what they do and what they sell. So, um, yeah, fear's a moneymaker. Tied in here is the whole concept of terrorism, uh, which is used as an excuse to do virtually everything in terrorism. Right. And the war on terror as though there is something out there called terror. That's a tactic. It's not a people. It's, yeah, it's a war on an adjective, too. You know, terror, yeah, you know, that, war on, <laughs> you know yeah. that, that's, that's always bothered me a little bit, too. You know, how do you tactically uh, attack terror? So, yeah. Well, you don't. You never win. That's, that's, you, that can be an excuse for the never-ending war. It, exactly. Okay, the next, your, la your last section was, uh, I guess, about how exceptional we are at making profits for our CEOs. Uh, <laughs> that that, that um, uh, you said that... that Bottom line, American companies are making massive profits at a time when most Americans have lost huge portions of their net accrued wealth. Uh, record profits by U.S. corporations. Right. There was a recent study um, you know, that showed that for 2010, that corporate profits account for 14% of the total national income. That's the largest rise since 1942 during wartime when corporations were making tons of money. It's one of the largest percentage increases on record. Uh, corporations also, uh, the Federal Reserve released a, a survey on consumer finances that reported just recently in June of 2012 that the middle class, and I, you quoted this earlier, lost a staggering 39% of their net wealth. I mean, that's, that's massive. They, they compared it to um, going from about $126,000 in net wealth to 77,000, putting the middle class basically back 20 years to 1992. And the, and the majority of this was due to the housing crisis and the recession. And again, as we all know, the housing crisis was, was this fabricated um, thing that was you know, thrown on the American people that, that to this day, as you and I know, no one's going to jail for. Yeah. You know? it's, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Right. Um, okay, so we're exceptional at being self-righteous uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, about how great we are and about all of our ideals. We're not very good at, say, educating our people, right. uh, taking care of our people in so many ways. You end your article by talking about uh, um, Occupy Wall Street's principles of solidarity, which you believe, I think, are addressing some of these problems. You, you know, Occupy was so um, excited last fall when Occupy Wall Street kind of came to fruition. You know, they are... You know, you talk about grassroots. That's a true grassroots movement that really came to power. And one of their principles of solidarity, which I talk about in the article, is that, you know, they state, we are daring to imagine a new sociopolitical and economic alternative that offers greater possibility of equality. And, you know, that's, that's important. You know, they're, they're talking about the things that we've kind of touched on earlier, that, you know, there's inequity in income. There's inequity in, in, in what people do in this country. And, you know, you know, we, you know, America is a, is a great country. You know, I talked about earlier yeah. and you mentioned it, that, you know, we're a creative people, we're innovative. And, and I really believe that America is, is, a, is, is a people, not as a government, yeah. is a loving country. You know, we really reach out and help other countries in, in many ways. But, you know, we don't, you know, if we can't treat our own people the way we'd want to treat other countries, you know, that, that's a real problem. But, again, Occupy Wall Street is 
is an impressive new grassroots movement that, that I hope to see continue. Well, do you think it's continuing? You know, I, I think it is. You know, we, we, I still see a lot of activity here in Austin the, the, and a lot of activity online, social media. Uh, there, there's still a lot of activity going on with Occupy Wall Street. So, you know, it's been kind of uh, pushed off by pundits on the left and the right. But it, it concerns me when I see the left kind of brushing off Occupy Wall Street. But I think the more you hear static from punditry on Occupy Wall Street, it means they're working. So, well, it's, it's, so much of, of what Wall Street did was it, it staked everything on a tactic, right? Uh, which was physical occupation, and that was something that couldn't go on forever. Uh, and, and there was a lot, so much fear of having leadership or having some kind of centralized sure. concept, uh, which was understandable, which was good in sure. many ways. But the question right now is whether... And I know there's just in Austin, and I'm aware of this too. There's still study groups going on. There's Absolutely. educational activity, and there's still are actual, you know, physical events. And I Absolutely. know there are things other places too. Uh, you know, it, the, I guess the whole question is, do we think it will evolve into new forms? I mean, you, you know, everything changes, so it, it it may do something different. Who knows? It's really up to OWS. But you know, I I, I still think the the principle of grassroots organization coming to bear with a democratic principle and and the thing that I think is quite important about Occupy Wall Street which was never really touched on is they have I think there's a there's a principle of nonviolence there that that they they truly believe that those three principles of organization democratic principle and nonviolence and is powerful it doesn't matter though how much you print you have a principled nonviolent position if uh, if people who aren't nonviolent uh, if you don't control that, right. or if you don't find a way to at least right. uh, have a, a, a speak to it uh, publicly, right. uh, they end up taking the publicity. They end up taking the four, uh, and it, which has happened in a number of places, especially in Oakland. Unfortunately, yeah. Uh, Unfortunately. So that's that's yeah. that's always a problem, but that's partly a problem that's inevitable because of the way the media looks for. Absolutely, it. they focused in on that. They didn't focus in on the real principles of what was going on. Right. Okay, one final thing about tying the question of Occupy, the Occupy movement into the, the, the larger picture of what you talked about in the article. Uh, what Occupy did, that, that the one issue that it grabbed on and tried to then use as a, as, a, as a hook for dealing with what's going on in this country was the discrepancy in wealth, the discrepancy in income, right. uh, which is, you know, obviously an incredibly legitimate issue, and it helped to change the conversation in the country to a great extent. What kind of lasting impact do you think that has had? Well, you know, one percent and ninety-nine percent has right. become part of the vocabulary. Absolutely, and I think that what it's done, what Occupy's done, which is powerful, which people I, I think still don't recognize, is changed the conversation. You know, it's talked about, you know, people talk about the 1%. They talk about the 99%. You know, we, we talk about that the typical American worker would have to labor for 244 years to make what the typical boss of a big public company makes in one year. You know, the, it, it, the median pay for U.S. workers was about $39,000 last year. That was up 1% from the year before, which is obviously not keeping up with inflation. So, I mean, Occupy has shown that, you know, the... They've kept this conversation going, and you still hear you still hear the, the president administration talking about equity, equality, you know, and that's that hadn't been talked about in years. I mean, you see you see historically through the labor movement and other portions in the history in this country that this has come up before, but it's good to see it raise its head again. You know, and that's that's one lasting thing I think Occupy's done. Okay, you're obviously involved not in just analyzing and writing about what's going on in the country, but you're also you've been involved significantly uh, and continuingly in, in activism and in, 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 uh, against war, you know, in support of uh, GIs returning and, and the problems that they face. Uh, you know, your work with Code Pink and, uh, uh, you know, you and Heidi, who's here with us, Heidi Turpin, in the studios today. Uh, Code Pink has been, uh, is a, is a, fascinating phenomenon and, and one of the things that Code Pink has done which I think has, has made it so important and relevant is that it's carried on that a grand tradition uh, which is the tradition of political theater uh, right. of using using visuals using right. you know to, to make statements that you wouldn't be able otherwise to communicate uh, 
Well, well, I'm not well, sure what the question is. But well, no, no, no. I, I kind of see where you're going. I've been involved, and in, really it was through Heidi initially, um, right after the start of the Iraq War, we kind of had this epiphany and said, gosh, you know, we have to get up and stand up. We have to do something, and we can't just watch this go on and on. And Heidi did some research and came. She said, I, I see this interesting group called Code Pink, and they have a local chapter. And Code Pink is... Uh, Women for Peace and Social Justice is a national organization, but they they have uh, uh, groups all over the country. And Austin has a very strong contingent, uh, Code Pink, and I'm, I'm a proud member of Code Pink. I, um, they, as you mentioned, they're very, um, you know, the East Street Theater. And, you know, we're not strong in numbers. We don't have 500 people here in Austin in Code Pink. We have a very, uh, you know, a core group of about a dozen people that works very hard on issues like the peace movement, immigration rights, uh, Palestinian rights. I mean, you name the issue. Code Pink's been there, and, and they stand out. I mean, you made a really good point. They they use Gonzo Street Theater to get people's attention. And let me tell you what, if you ask a pundit on the right, you know, he'll turn his nose up and say, ah, oh, Code Pink. Or if you ask somebody on the left, and, you know, people on the left make fun of Code Pink, but they know who we are. And, you know, the message, the important thing is to get the message out there to get attention and, and to really to make sure that the banking crisis, I mean, they're, they're at the, all those meetings with the, the senators and the hearings, and they're, they're standing up holding signs. I mean, I have incredible amount of respect for Code Pink. They, they have not remained silent really on any issue of peace and social justice in the last nine years. One of the founders of Code Pink, uh, who is one of the most wonderful people in the world, Diane Wilson, right. uh, was on our show. We did an hour with her, and it was a yep. terrific show. Uh, and she's, I mean, her record of, of doing... Of, political theater and civil disobedience, right. which they go very well together, you know, as an eco outlaw, you know, right. as a shrimper uh, from in the uh, right. uh, Gulf Coast, uh, Gal- uh, the, not Galveston, but the Texas Gulf Coast. Right. Right. Uh, it, her record is amazing. And so she brought, I think, a lot of that energy. Absolutely. Uh, Jody Evans, Medea Benjamin, Medea Diane Benjamin. Wilson were the three that founded Code Pink. Yeah. You mentioned Diane. We were at the, the BP uh, protest a couple years back at BP headquarters in Houston. And again, the, the street theater of, you know, you get attention by doing really effective visual street theater and then one of the reporters show up, then you talk about your message. And that's what Code Pink does the best. The message at that event was partly that it, I don't remember what the theme, how, how it was put together, but, but it was getting naked. What was the... Well, what, it, well the theme and, was... The although theme, he, Heidi said that she came as a dead fish. Right. The not, theme was BP, you kill me. And, you, and for instance, Heidi dressed up like a fish and coated herself with this this fake oil. And, right. and you know, it was, it was all over international news. Reuters, everybody had pictures of Code Pink. Because, of course, Diane Wilson, like, poured oil on herself. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, Diane... Congress in Washington. Right. And as you mentioned, Diane Wilson is a shrimper. I mean, she was outraged. I mean, this affects her livelihood yeah. and the people of Texas. So, yeah. I'm Thorne Dreyer. We'll be right back. That ribbon of highway And I saw above me That endless skyway I saw below me That golden valley This land was made for you and me Woody Guthrie with his version of America the Beautiful, as it were. Uh, And as it is. Exactly. Uh, okay, Jim Turpin is my guest on RAG Radio. I'm Thorne Dreyer. Jim is an Austin activist and writer, uh, a regular contributor or an occasional contributor uh, to the RAG blog and has written an article about American exceptionalism, which you can find by going to the ragblog.blogspot.com, a pretty remarkable article. Uh, has written other stuff primarily about the military, uh, the endless war, the um, about due process and special ops, about the fog of war, just very, very important things that are probably underreported uh, in our society. You wrote about military suicides and PTSD in 2010. Uh, you said at that time, you said that an article in the New York Times has confirmed what the organizers of the Colleen-based GI coffee house under the hood with which you were involved 
have been battling at Fort Hood for the last, for then the last year and a half. Suicides at the highest point since 2008 with 14 confirmed suicides since the beginning of 2010. And I think that those statistics have continued to rise. I think right. they continue to be at an all-time high. Right. Uh, you said the repeated deployment of military personnel who suffer from both physical and psychological wounds has led to all-time high suicide rates, but it's also uh, it, it's led to the incredibly widespread uh, mental health problems, uh, the various uh, aspects of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, tell me a little bit about your experience working with Under the Hood Coffee House, uh, which is a, a pretty significant thing, and it's a grand tradition in Colleen because there was a coffee house, the Oleo Strut, uh, in, uh, during the Vietnam War, a uh, GI anti-war coffee house that was there then. So, Absolutely. The, the Under the Hood Cafe and Outreach Center, um, in the tradition of the Oleo Strut, which was at Fort Hood, Fort Hood is the largest military base in the United States at any one time. One of the had, largest in the world. In the world. It has anywhere from fifty to 60,000 soldiers at any time. They've deployed to both theaters of war. Uh, the 30 ACR is there. It's, it's a huge military base. Um, in 2009, a, a number of organizations, Code Pink Austin, Veterans for Peace, uh, and other organizations decided to open a coffee house in the tradition of Oleo Strut. You know, the, the intent of Under the Hood really was to make this a non-military environment where active duty and vets and civilian and peace allies could, could work with those soldiers in a non-military environment to really work on the debilitating effects of war. And, you know, what are some of those things that those soldiers are... And also to give them a place where they could help each other. Absolutely. Abs absolutely. A, a the, the, the thing that I find interesting about this country is um, we have all these returning active duty and vets coming back from these two theaters of war from Iraq and Afghanistan. And the thing that I, that I kind of see happening is, you know, welcome home, now pretend you're normal. Yeah. You know, well, here are young men and women that have been you know, subjected to the, the, I mean, the horrific outcomes and, and processes of war. Um, you, you know, we have about 313 million people in this country, and only about two and a half million have actually gone over and served. That's less than 1% of our population. So as a good friend of mine, Alice Embry says, and I know you know Alice, this-, this For a few decades. Yeah, <laughs> right, is that this war just doesn't concern the general population. People think they're supporting the war by putting a yellow magnet, a ribbon on the back of their car, and that's that's ludicrous. You know, you know, we we have to do something through these returning vets. And some of the statistics, like you mentioned, are staggering. This year, for the first time ever, since January of June of this year, there have been more suicides than combat deaths in Afghanistan. Yeah, that's an there, amazing statistic. There have been a hundred, I believe it's 154 suicides. Instead, and that 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 exceeds the number of combat deaths in Afghanistan, or at least they, I mean they become combat deaths in a sense. Well, ab ab <laughs> absolutely. And actually, there uh, Time Magazine, and I've not read the article, but the, there's a the cover says one a day on the front of Time Magazine, and they're referring to the suicides. And so this is a huge issue. And, and the other issues that are really out there, Thorn, are post traumatic stress disorder. And a lot of these figures are kind of hard to get a handle on. The DOD, really, I think, lowballs these numbers. But the, the, 20 to 50 percent of our attorney vets have post-traumatic stress syndrome. Uh, 15 to 30 percent su suffer from traumatic brain injury. And one in three women that serve in our armed forces are victims of military sexual trauma, which means they've been sexually assaulted. That's, I, you know, before I started working with veterans, I had never heard of that. I mean, that's a stunning statistic to think that one in three women that serve in our military, you know, have, I call that the unforgiv unforgivable rot. I mean, why, how can we possibly allow this to go on in the military for our women that serve? Unemployment rates for our veterans hover around 9 to 12 percent, much higher than the normal uh, unemployment rates. Homelessness for all vets, now this of course includes Vietnam vets, et cetera, but 40 percent of homeless men in this country are veterans. On any given night, 100 to 130 to 200,000 veterans are living on the street. So, I mean, these kind of statistics are, I mean, they're just unacceptable. Right? Okay, Vietnam was clearly a horrific war and had, I mean, incredible consequences, terrible consequences, especially on those who fought there. Uh, we didn't see these kind of statistics then uh, that we see now, and I don't know whether it's because we just didn't, 
do that. We didn't know uh, it, whether we just didn't have that kind of the access to that kind of information. But why is this so bad now? Is it multiple deployments? It, it, is well, it the fact that these wars we don't know why we're fighting them, and and that there's no sort of I mean, what are the why? why well, is I, I think so you hit it just pretty much on the head immediately. In Vietnam, there was a year's service in Vietnam, and 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 then you re-upped if you wanted to, and in some. Uh, soldiers during that time period did go back to Vietnam, multiple tours. This is a different kind of war. This is uh, multiple deployments. You know, I, I talked about we've had 2.3 million men and women serve in these wars. More than half or about half of them have done multiple deployments. Some of these young men and women have done four, five, five. six, seven, eight, nine deployments. And with each deployment, the, the science shows that the opportunity for PTSD increases. I mean, you know, if you're exposed to these horrific incidences in war and you're, you're I mean, obviously you're going to have an, an opportunity to, to be... And I would imagine that the ability to adjust back to society becomes greater, too, the more that... Right. right. But, the, but the issue on, 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 the, on, okay. the, on the back end with under the hood, with the issue of PTSD, with the issue of traumatic brain injury and military sexual trauma is uh, under the hood works very closely with Iraq vets against the war. And I know you've had them on as, as guests in the past, but we have a number of IVAW members right now at Under the Hood, and they're working on a project called Operation Recovery. Bottom line, Operation Recovery is just a campaign that is led by active duty soldiers and veterans that working together to ensure that service members have access to the care they deserve, that they need, and to stop the deployment of traumatized troops suffering from PTSD, TBI, and military sexual trauma. You know, they're, they're, they're redeploying these soldiers over and over again that they know have PTSD. And, you know, th that's wrong. Obviously, it's wrong. Those soldiers need to stop being redeployed. They need the care they deserve. And to be honest, the care they're even receiving, Thorne, is substandard at, at best. Peremptory, just not even... Well, the, they're not getting the, 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 the psychotherapy they need. They don't have enough psychotherapists. The, the, the course of treatment for many of these young men and women is psychotropics, you know, benzodiazepines, those kind of things. And that's <laughs> Which kind of mirrors well, the, that, way, the way mental health is treated in our society. Right, and, you know, that, and that's not going to work yeah. for, the, for, for these folks. So, you know, what, what IVAW is asking along with Under the Hood is we're asking General Campbell, who's the, 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 the acting uh, person that to enforce the command policies that prevent service members to be redeployed. And that's what Operation Recovery is about. We have people on the ground there that are meeting with active duty and with vets to, to do that. So it's powerful. Were these issues, be, how, you know, how, how much were these issues even being raised before? How much were they being made public? How, how, how important have these efforts been in making people aware of them? And what has been the response of the military brass? Well, what's what have, have they actually adjusted and well, done Well, interesting you ask that because we've asked for, under the hood and IVAW, has asked for repeated face-to-face -face meetings with the staff at, at Fort Hood. And they've basically been denied. But we were able earlier this year to get them to do a virtual town hall to really start talking about these issues. It's the first time ever this has ever happened. And it, unfortunately, it wasn't face to face, but it was at least we were able to turn their hands somewhat and to, to bring to bear, to make them finally face the fact that, um, you know, these issues aren't being addressed for, for, the, for these soldiers, for these active duty and for these vets. What do you have ahead? What's going on now with Under the Hood? We have a couple things going on. Um, pretty much most Thursdays, we have something called ribs and rights where any active duty or vet can show up. They have a barbecue outside and they have the ability to talk about, every GI has what's called GI rights. They have the ability to do certain things when they're in the uniform, and they have certain rights to, to speak out, to, to receive care, to do other things. And uh, basically what Under the Hood does is they apprise GIs of their rights. That, that's, that's an important thing. Most GIs don't know they even have rights. Uh, coming up on July 17th, there's a War is Trauma art opening. This is a... Um, really amazing collection of art from uh, that, that, that IVAW's put put together uh, with the Just Seeds Art Collective and it's a number of posters that were done by vets and others and it's gonna be playing at uh, I believe it's Central uh, Central Texas College on the 17th at uh, 7 p.m. And the last thing I'll just throw in there yeah. quickly is on July 20th, um, they're doing a screening of The Invisible War, which is about this topic of military right. sexual trauma, right. an important one. 
how unique is what's being done at Under the Hood? Is there much of this kind of activity going on around the country? How, how active is IVAW? There are at least a couple of other coffee houses, aren't there? There are. There were a number over the years. Some have not been able to survive. Um, there's Coffee Strong at Fort Lewis. Right, right. And then there's a coffee house in Germany. So really, there are now three coffee houses. Uh, David Rovix, who was on my show just a couple of weeks ago, had a Coffee Strong T-shirt on. Oh, that's on great. Show, so. that's, that's great. Yeah. And, you know, they're, they're doing good work like everyone else. IVAW is keeping these issues to the front. And, and I think when they're allied with the coffee house, we also have a strong contingent of Civilian Soldier Alliance. That's a group that works very closely on a lot of these issues. We have a number of member CSA folks there as well. So they're, they're a great ally with Under the Hood as well. Okay, we've got a, just a general culture of war going on. And, you know, you wrote on the rag blog about the endless war in American society, you know, and uh, you've also written about the questions of, of uh, special ops and assassination. How do we address this, this, this culture? Uh, how do we change that? How do we affect that? Well, one of the articles I, I wrote about was uh, the, the militarization of the U.S. society. Right. And, you know, you see, if you're watching TV, you'll see um, jewelry ads with guys in khakis, or you'll see auto insurance ads with guys in khakis, and you'll see, I mean, it's, it's amazing how this has kind of trickled down to our society. It's in video games, it's in movies, it's in music, and, you know, it's kind of endemic in our society, but... Um, you know, what do you do? You know, your question is, what do you do to change that? What yeah, do you do to make a difference? Um, yeah, we're, we're coming towards the end of the show, and that's right. a part of what I always like to talk sure. about towards the end is what sure. we can do, what people can do. What well, we can well, well, I think, uh, honestly, it's, it's organized, whether it's at the local level. Under the Hood's a great example. You know, that was a coalition of local organizations that came together that said, what can we do to make a difference? And many times I tell myself, you know, we're, we're, we're making an incremental difference. You know, an example of the hood is we've helped those soldiers. Some of those soldiers get CO status, conscientious objector status, with helping them with legal referrals. You know, if you take a soldier... You've of, also had some soldiers who have refused deployment. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, some of the things we offered under the hood are, are referrals for legal uh, counsel for those kind of issues, referrals for psychological, some of the things we've talked about. But, you know, if you take that soldier out of the combat theater, you know, th let's, let's also consider... You know, we talked about money, cost of war. One of the ways we change war is one person at a time, it's I guess. exactly right. Yeah. But, you know, we've done massive... We can all refuse to do it. What, it right. <laughs> you know, you know, it starts it, with the individual. You right. know, and there's a great, there's a great T-shirt that uh, IVAW has. This is support GI resistance. Yeah. And, you know, I think that says it all. Yeah. And, and uh, for those of us who were around during the Vietnam War and around in organizing against the Vietnam War... GI resistance then, I mean, it, there's a, there was a precedent. GI resistance then was remarkable, widespread uh, in Vietnam and at home among, among veterans who returned, among active duty GIs, both on the bases and in Vietnam. There was a major resistance movement. A absolutely. Uh, part of that, that, it's a very different time because you had a draft. And the draft made so much difference in terms of who was, you know, who went to war. Right. Um, so, okay, tell us, how do people find out more about what's going on with Under the Hood? One of the ways they can do is they can go to the website. It's underthehoodcafe.org, or if they want to go on Facebook, of course, they can go facebook.com slash underthehoodcafe. And tons of information out there, upcoming events, you know, all things that if they're interested, they can check out. Okay, tell me a little bit more about what Code Pink is up to and how people can find out more about that. CodePinkAustin.com, that's the website uh, that they can look at, or they can go to... Uh, or if they're not in Austin, because we have folks listening all over the place. Right, they can There's just Google Code Pink, and it'll bring up uh, Code Pink. And Code Pink, again, I, I talked about, addresses a number of issues. Uh, they talk about... Um, um, uh, we talked about uh, Palestinian rights earlier. I mean, the, the, if it's an issue of peace and social justice, Code Pink's on it. Okay, and as, as an advocate for, as, as someone involved in working on public health issues, uh, what do you think we can do to address the public health problems that we've got right now? Uh, obviously, pr probably our number one problem is, is obesity. I, I would think maybe, or right. it's certainly right. right up there is, I mean, along with lack of ins health insurance for such a large percentage of our people. You know, you talk about obesity, you know, that's a multifactorial thing. It's yes. lack of insurance. It's if you're poor, you know, access to food. We talked about food deserts. I mean, you know, that, that's, that's a big one to bite off. It, it's it, it's going to be difficult. You know, we, 
not helping is by refusing to take $13 billion from the government for Medicaid. And when I, again, we talked about that earlier. When I read that, I was just I was stunned. You know, you, if you're not helping the people that need the help, then I mean, you're, you're just it, this is going to be a tsunami of of health um, health issues in the future for the for this population. As an activist who's been involved on uh, many fronts over the last few years, uh, how scary is are, are the politics in this country today, and, and are the, the levels of pub, uh, public opinion and the ease in which mis disinformation is, 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 I mean, how, you know, what do you feel well, about uh, how we can change all that? <laughs> how can, we can affect what's going on in this society right now? Well, and I mean, obviously organizing, but. Yeah, it, it's, you know, be informed, read, you know, be a critical thinker. You know, we talked about that earlier. <laughs> you know, be a critical. Part of the Republican platform was to, was to was to get, was fighting critical think quote critical thinking, right? Well, yeah. The platform for 2012 under the education section is they're against critical thinking. You know, and, and to me, you know, how do you fight that? You know, that that's a tough one. You yeah. know, that's yeah. a tough one. Critical thinking, uh, and education has to be. Uh, part of the at equation. The core, at yeah, the core part of the absolutely of the part of the equation. Right. Okay, I would recommend that everyone read uh, Jim Turpin's r remarkable article about uh, uh, the myth of American exceptionalism uh, at the Rag Blog, and that's at the Ragblog.blogspot.com. Um, okay, thank you. This has been great. Great. I really great. appreciate the opportunity, Thorne. Thanks. Jim Turpin. Uh, next, uh, in, in two weeks uh, on RAG Radio, we're going to have uh, uh, Brady Coleman, uh, who was a, uh, uh, has an incredible history. He was, he was one of the very significant movement lawyers back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, he's also an actor who's done some wonderful work and is a musician. Uh, and with Brady, we're going to have the Melancholy Ramblers. Uh, which will be a lot of fun performing live, and also uh, Jim Simons, who was uh, is going to join us for that show. He was he and Brady Coleman and Cam Cunningham were the sort the Movement Law Collective uh, in Austin, uh, and um, Cam Cunningham, Cunningham just died, uh, and so there's there's a lot of reminiscing to do there. I mean, they, this, they were involved in some major national cases. And it was very significant because uh, we folks in the movement back then got into a lot of trouble and we needed a lot of help. <laughs> so uh, I'm Thorne Dreyer. Thank you, Tracy Schultz. Uh, this is RAG Radio. Uh, catch you next time.